Mateusz, the stage is yours. Thanks. So first of all, thank you that I have under time the possibility to be here to present for you guys. Um, I do really appreciate it. And well done to Gustavo for a really great presentation. So let's kick this off with the concurrency. So um, let's kick this off what concurrency basically is. So concurrency is a form of a computing in which several computations are executed current, concurrently during overlapping time period instead of sequentially with one completing before the next starts. So that's the quote taken directly from the Wikipedia. Maybe we are just going to wrap it in other words. So um, imagine you have a bunch of toys and you want to play with them all at the same time. So concurrency is just like a bit like that. It's when a computer program can do multiple things at once, just like you playing with your toys simultaneously. You might be, for example, building Lego tower and um, coloring the um, coloring book. You are doing two things at the same time, just like the concurrency. Um, in Elixir, different parts of program can work on their own tasks without waiting for others to be finished. If we are talking about the concurrency in Elixir, we have to cover the matter of BIM because Elixir is built on the top of the BIM model. So maybe let's start um, with the abbreviation. So BIM stands for um, Bogdan Erlang Abstract Machine. However, as far as I know, B could stand for also Bjorn, Bjorn Gustafsson, who were involved in creating Erlang programming language. So um, Elixir's concurrency comes from the Erlang's virtual machine, that is BIM. Um, the fundamental aspect of BIM models is its use of processes. And to be more precise, BIM on its own is just a process. Processes created and managed by BIM are extremely lightweight in terms of memory and processing overhead. Um, that means this enables Elixir programs to, to handle massive numbers of concurrent tasks efficiently, making it well suited for building scalable and fault tolerance systems. And when we are talking about fault tolerancy, um, BIM gives us excellent fault tolerance mechanism thanks to the isolated processes um, isolation between processes prevents one process from um, crashing the entire system. Processes can communicate through the messages passing and receiving. And um, if some process will fail, um, it can be restarted with the minimal impact on the overall system. What's worth um, mentioning is that uh, processes doesn't share the memory as they do in other languages, like for example, Java, um, each process has its own um, memory address. Um, Built-in concurrency primitives, that's the next thing that Beam provides us with. It's um, built-in support for managing concurrency through process and message passing. Um, it's making easier to design and implement concurrent and distributed systems. And when we are talking about the distributing, um, Beam is excellent in the distribute works um, and it uses scheduler for that. Scheduler is, um, is a feature, um, some kind of the design to take advantage of um, all available uh, CPU courses on a system by default. The Beam scheduler is responsible for distributing and managing the execution of lightweight processes across multiple CPU cores that are available in our system, providing concurrency and parallelism without requiring explicit management from the developer side. When we are talking about the um, BIM, we have to cover also the OTP. So what is OTP? OTP um, abbreviation stands for Open Telecom Platform. So OTP is a set of libraries, design principles for building scalable, fault-tolerant and distributed software systems. Um, Elixir leverages OTP as a foundational framework using its abstractions like gen servers, supervisors, and message passing to enable building highly concurrent and um, reliable applications. So 
Um, I'm going to take a while right now because it might be a little bit confusing. What's the difference between the Beam and OTP? So the Beam is the runtime environment for Elixir and Erlang, of course. However, the OTP is set of the toolkits, um, design principles, and some other principles that are created on the top of the Beam machine. And um, according to the Beam, we should also cover one of the drawback, that is memory intensity. Um, although the processes are really lightweight and um, can, each process can have some kind of the memory overhead, um, this can lead to increased memory, memory usage in the application, especially when we have a lot of processes. Basic, uh, basic uh, principles of open telecom platform is process and concurrency supervision trees that are in, um, that are responsible for um, restarting crashed processes, um, gen servers, message passing, and fault tolerance. When we are talking about the concurrency and elixir, we have to cover what process basically is. So process, we can call it also the actor. So a process is in elixir is a lightweight isolated and concurrent execution unit that communicates with other processes through message passing, enabling um, sky level and fault tolerant systems. In Elixir, when you create a process using spawn function, you are creating an actor, so a process is just an actor. In other words, uh, we can imagine that we have a bunch of friends who want to work on um, one thing, but we, they would like to divide it, building one thing into some parts like for example, building a Lego castle. Each friend work on their own part without bothering others. In Elixir, processes, um, processes like a um, small um, team that can do their own job without bothering others. Um, what is important, these processes can talk to each other and share important information while building the Lego castle. Um, this helps to make sure the whole project goes smoothly and doesn't fall apart if something goes wrong with one part. So um, Elixir processes help make things work well and more organized. So summing up, um, the base characteristic of Elixir processes are each process is isolated from other processes. That means that the memory is not shared across all of the processes. Each process has its own memory address. Processes communicate by sending and receiving messages. Thanks to that, um, they do not have to interact without directly sharing the memory, which they do not. Which they do not. Um, processes are independent units of executions. Processes are lightweight and consume minimal memory, as minimal as it is possible. They are um, lighter than normal operating system um, processes. We can create the hierarchical structure of processes to monitor and manage the life cycle of child processes. That means we can have some kind of the structure of parent and a children, where parent is taking the responsibility of the children that it's job will be done properly and if the child will fail the parent will be responsible for um, restarting it for example and the processes can run concurrently on multiple cpu cores use cases of elixir's concurrency that's a very interesting topic so for example chat and messaging applications so elixir concurrency is ideal for chat and messaging apps that require handling many concurrent users and messages. Each user session can be managed by a separate process, ensuring isolation and fault tolerance. Um, when we would like to build chat application, um, we could use the um, channels and sockets that Phoenix provide us with. Um, they are just under the hood processes. Real-time applications and IoT, so Elixir is well suited for building real-time applications such as uh, live di dashboards, monitoring systems, and IoT devices, Internet of Things. Um, its lightweight processes handle incoming data streams and update them efficiently. Um, the example of real-time application could be, for example, stock market. 
Um, just imagine if we would be having three providers and three different things would be um, bought by us on three different stocks. Then we could buy the API application program interface, just merge them into our application, and we uh, we would be having the possibility to see all of the things just in the one application instead of three in three providers. According to um, IoT devices, for example, the system which will um, gather all of the information about our has household about our temperature, about the motion detection, about the security cameras, or on some kind of plantation like tomato, tomato plantation, um, the heatness, um, and, and so on. Also, the great example is data processing and streaming. So Elixir's concurrency model is useful for data processing and streaming applications that need to handle large volumes of data concurrently. The app example is analytics dashboard. And I have um, linked here two really great libraries that could help us with it. One of them is GenStage. GenStage could help us with implementing back pressure. And also we could um, divide our application for the um, different stages, for different data to be processed. Flow um, is the library, is a module, which um, allow us to do some kind of the um, computations on the collections, same as Stream and Enum allows us to. However, Flow under the hood uses GenStage. So um, in, in one word, I can say it's using the concurrency model and um, it's using the processes under the hood. Another examples, so these are telecommunication systems, for example, really great OTP, distributed systems and microservices, highly concurrent APIs and fault tolerant systems. Let's go to next topic, which is advantages of Elixir with overcoming common concurrency challenges, um, which appears in different languages. So let's start with global interpreter log in Ruby. So um, Ruby, Ruby's GIL, it's global interpreter log, restrict true parallel execution of threads in a single um, Ruby process, this can lead to performance bottlenecks and limit the ability to fully utilize multi-core processors. Um, global interpreter log um, allows only one thread to be executed in the interpreter on the one time. In Elixir, lightweight processes run in a separate memory spaces and can achieve true parallelism across multiple CPU cores without a guild-like restriction. Um, in Ruby, we have few workarounds in which we could go for. For example, one of them is using some kind of the C extension. That means we should write C code um, with the multi-threading, and then we could um, link it into our Ruby application. Um, we could use also non-CPU bound threads, or we could use JRuby. JRuby is like... Um, Ruby implementation, but on the JVM. And as far as I know, global interpreter log appears also in the Python. However, as I was told once, um, it's going to be additional thing. It's not going to be ob obligatory since next version, as far as I know. But um, this happens for now also in the Python, um, only in the C Python, not in the Jiten, which is Python implementation based on JVM, Java Virtual Machine, or Iron Python, which is the Python implementation built on the top of um, .NET framework, because they use some kind of different um, concurrency model. Um, according to the GIL, uh, it's some kind of the historical implementation, which was introduced to simplify memory management and avoid complex low-level thread synchronization um, issues in, in Python. Lack of fault isolation. So in languages without the built-in fault isolation, a failure in one thread can potentially crush the entire process or even the application. Um, that things might happen in the Java, C++, or C hash. Um, in Elixir, supervision trees 
and the process isolation ensured that failures in one process do not propagate to others, enhancing, increasing the overall fault tolerance of the system. And um, threat synchronization challenges. Many languages require explicit synchronization mechanisms like logs, semaphores, and monitors to avoid the race conditions and ensure data consistency when multiple threads can access shared memory. So um, long story short, what are semaphores? So semaphores are some kind of the um, synchronization mechanism used in concurrent programming to control access to a shared resource among multiple um, threads or processes. As far as I know, we have two types of semaphores. One of them is binary and second one is um, counting. Uh, semaphore is a really great me mechanism. However, we should be really um, careful when we are implementing it. Um, Elixir's actor model and message passing inherently avoid shared memory and the associated synchronization complexities. Thanks to that, we do not have to worry about low level synchronization. Okay, let's go further. How to gain knowledge. Okay, so before we are going to go here, how to gain knowledge about the concurrency, we are just going to move on to the coding part. So something that is going to be definitely much more interesting than the um, theoretical part. So um, in this module, I have prepared three quick examples. Let's kick this off with the first one. As you can see, I have created here a simple function that is called add. It takes two arguments, first and second, and it's just adding the, um, the, the numbers. So if, when we are just going to execute that function, then as you can see, we have process sleep for three seconds, and then after the three seconds, we are prompted with our result. What we could see here is that we are not allowed to use the terminal because um, because the process is being um, done here. So to avoid it and um, execute the process concurrently, we can spawn the given function, and thanks to that, we will it will be um, computed concurrently on the CPU cores. And thanks to that, we do not have to wait till this one will be finished, and we will be we could do um, whatever we want in the terminal. So let's take a look at it. Concurrency, um, async add one two, and as you can see, it returned bid, and after three seconds, it returned us our result. And as you could see the terminal is still available so we can do whatever we want to. It's really great because it, it works really great with the arrays, for example. Let's go uh, to create some some lists, pass it to an each, and um, in an each we can like uh, execute our async add with given number. And as you can see, it just returned OK as n of each. And after three seconds, we didn't have to wait nine seconds, three seconds for one, three seconds for two, three seconds for three. We just waited three seconds. And in the three seconds, we've got all of the results. What would happen if we would do it in the normal add function without any kind of um, asynchronous job? three seconds and we've got two, one plus one, three seconds and we've got four, two plus two, and three seconds we've got six, three plus three. So as you can see, we had to wait nine seconds to get all of the things done and here just three seconds. So that's the async strategy that um, is really good with the concurrency. Next thing is simple process communication, how the processes communicate um, so as you can see, we can create the process concurrency start link, and we can assign it to, to the PID. And as you can see, it returned out that it returns as a PID. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can you make the font a bit larger? Thanks. Uh, could you font? Okay, sorry. Um, 
Wait a second. Just, just zoom in, command plus. Okay. Is that okay right now? Yeah, it's no. okay. Okay, that's great. So um, it returned us the PID. PID is the process identifier. Um, is the unique identifier for each process we create in our Elixir application. And um, to communicate uh, with the process, we can set, send the message to our PID with the message, some message. And um, as you can see, it matched with line number 29 and we've got output, output it received some message in process and self also uh, returned the process that um, were executed. We can see that this given process is still alive. It's alive. And um, we can go further and we can match it to the exit function. And um, right now the um, process is killed and it's no longer available. It's no longer um, alive. So that's the, the short shortcut, how the simple process communication works in the Elixir. Let's go to the next one. That is the um, parallel map. Parallel map um, is the mapping strategy that we are using task async and task await. Um, and thanks to that, the um, mapping is done in the concurrent way, not in the sequential way. That means um, every single thing uh, will be displayed at once instead of waiting in sequential order. We can just take a look at it right now. Concurrency, double list, doubling one. We are waiting three seconds and so on and so on. Okay, and here's doubled list. As you can see, it returned the each number times by two as it is done in the double function. So um, we are supposed to wait 15 seconds to get it done. Um, we can do it also asynchronously. And as you can see, it was done just in three seconds instead of waiting 15 seconds. And here we have the same result as here. So um, we have benefits of parallel map um, that is improved performance, um, simplified code, um, task async is pretty straightforward to introduce um, and it doesn't require low level concurrency management from our side. We have also isolation and um, fault tolerance. So that's the thing I was talking previously. Um, it's about if one process will fail, it's not going to um, crash the entire system. And also load balancing. So it's some kind of distributing work evenly among processes. Um, each process uh, will be contributed equally. And um, regarding the spawn functionality, um, as the event docs suggested, Typically, developers do not use the spawn functions. Instead, they use abstractions such as task, gen server, and agent, which are built on top of the spawn. So um, long story short, um, we should use task module when we want to perform concurrent asynchronous computations or operations that can be parallelized. Um, task provides a simple and convenient way to work with the uh, lightweight and isolated processes for concurrent um, executions. Agent is just a simple abstraction around the state. It can be used when we want to share messages and receive messages between the processes. And the gen server is just like generic server, is a module that provides some kind of the behavior for our, for our um, client server relation. And, we are, and when we are talking about the gen server, we can go for it because I have also some really quick example of it as well. So 
Um, first things first, we are just going to create a um, gen server state with some kind of the initial value that is going to be zero. It's going to return OK and PID. PID is, of course, our universal um, identifier. And um, gen server help us um, to keep the state in given process. So for example, we can go further with that and um, we can increment our PID. And as you can see, it's going to return the incremented value. As it is done here, we have implemented some kind of the behavior. Same thing could be done with the decrementing. And also um, we can get the number of given PID. We can also um, build plenty of the um, processes in the gen server on which we can later on manipulate. And as you can see, the state in given gen server um, is being um, kept. So um, some cons of uh, using the gen server is that it simplifies the management of shared state and provides a clear structure for handling concurrent um, operations in a concurrent and fault tolerance um, systems. So yeah, um, that's, that's it basically from the live coding part, if I can call it like that. And let's go back to the presentation. So how to gain the knowledge about the concurrency? So first of all, read the documentation about the processes. Processes are in the kernel part. Um, task module, agent module, gen server, gen stage, flow, and Broadway. That are These are one of the most um, popular um, libraries and modules. Read books, for example, concurrency in Elixir. Um, participate in meetups and discussions. Read code, for example, do some kind of the code review, read code on the GitHub. And the most important thing, write your own code. And that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mateusz. Uh, that was a great one. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. And I hope the, the audience liked it. And um, uh, let's uh, move on to the Q&A part. Uh, so if uh, anyone's got a uh, a question to Mateusz, then uh, go ahead and uh, ask away. Uh, so there was some um, talk uh, in the chat uh, with Dave, uh, who had a, a remark um, about uh, Ruby's no, no, uh, new functionality named Raktors, which is actually something that introduces the actor model to Ruby. Uh, probably an interesting thing to follow. Uh, it's not going to make... Uh, it, it's not going to... Um, move over any you know f further uh, traits of Erlang or Elixir to that language, but it's uh, nonetheless an interesting thing that we can follow in the future. Uh, and we have a question uh, from uh, Jeril. Uh, so uh, there were times before where I encountered database timeouts when I write concurrent code. For example, gen server handle call, task await many, and task async, async stream, which uh, asynchronously write, write this to multiple the database records. I suspect that this has to, something to do with the connection to the DB connection pool. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to prevent this issue aside from chunking? So, Mateusz, do you have any immediate thoughts on that? Um. To be honest, it's hard for me right now to suggest something when I don't see the the code base. So um, it's really hard for me to, to suggest something for now. Um, maybe instead of just chunking, 
we would introduce here the um, mentioned hierarchical structure of the processes, which will um, take a look on the processes and manage whether the state has been um, written to the database. Yeah, maybe this this also has something to do with uh, with database connection pools, which is some sometimes something that's out of our control, uh, or at least uh, external to the application itself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is this is probably more complicated than that. Um, let me think if I've got anything to add here. Well, I, I think this this often is actually a bottleneck, the DB, DB connection pools, and uh, you have to be pretty smart at managing that uh, to see uh, to, uh, to to for example set set this uh, correctly up uh, according to the machine's capabilities and so on in terms of the uh, in terms of the CPU uh, core count and so on. Uh, so um, that's probably not in the scope of this uh, of this topic itself, but is uh, nonetheless an interesting one. So maybe we will come back to this in the future with some uh, different presentations on this one. Uh, one of the one, one of one of you guys is uh, is uh, has come up with an idea of. Uh, Timeout infinity parameter that you can pass into those uh, into the database connection setup, but basically, uh, I personally think setting timeout to infinity in production is not really is never really a good idea to be honest, uh, because it makes the system a bit more prone to. Uh, susceptible to, to denial of service attacks. Uh, so um, some kind of a queuing mechanism could be better in this case. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, if I can just any... yeah. um, sorry, Michal, if I just can interrupt, Gerald, do not hesitate if you wanted to share with us if you can the code. Um, I think I'm, I I. I, me personally, I can help you. Just do not hesitate to share your code with us. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much for this question. Uh, is there any other, are there any other questions that you guys would like to ask Mateusz? I said that Sabit Curiosium asked uh, if I can share those two files. Of course I can. Uh, I'm going to make it right after the meetup. It will be available on um, Curiosium GitHub. Yeah, I think uh, I think this is a good idea to share the examples. Um, so we will keep you guys posted about this. Someone's writing. So I guess we might have another question coming in. Uh, in a moment. So, yeah, Jared is saying, I was thinking of making a bug without, without DB persistence and only rely on the servers. Is it possible? Uh, I think, I, I think maybe if I, if I can jump in real quick, everything's possible because, um, there is okay making this kind of applications is is possible but practically there is always a moment of, uh, at which you will need to take into account some some kind of uh, persistence and it not might not be something that you do with postgres it might be something that you do with some NoSQL database it might be done with Manesia. um whatever else basically uh, but real world applications rarely ever uh, come without any uh, persistence related uh, stuff 
so while it's possible as a proof of concept, it's probably not uh, practical to think of real-world applications without database level persistence. So that's my take on it. Uh, Mateusz might uh, might add something to this, but I think that's pretty much pretty much uh, it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, so Sabit is is saying uh, is asking us when should we use stream and when would it be more efficient than task, etc. So, um, in my humble opinion, first of all, um, stream should be used when we are just dealing with really, really, really large data sets. Sometimes even can say in finite data sets. However, um, in the um, task, we are just, we are, we are taking the um, advantage of parallel processing to speed up the transformations. Um, stream give us uh, the lazy sequential transformation, lazy evaluation of collections and um, task gives us parallel transformations. Um, when when to use one of these? To be honest, to be honest, I don't I don't know for now. So so basically, uh, it's probably not a. It's pro it's probably not uh, not the right things to compare here, right? Because um, stream uh, stream itself does not mean anything's actually uh, anything's actually being uh, parallelized. Uh, so there's uh, so basically stream itself does not create any processes and this kind of uh, this kind of stuff. So maybe maybe the, the the right thing to compare would be maybe stream uh, stream versus flow maybe because flow is is uh, is playing a kind of a similar role to Inno and stream in many cases. So that would be the the right thing to compare. Uh, and I think uh, I think as the complexity of data rises, there is more and more uh, incentive to use uh, concurrent paradigms like flow and this kind of stuff and tasks and so on. Um, but basically, uh, premature optimization should also be avoided. So it's not it's not a good idea to use it straight away in all cases. That's my take on it. Um, so the next one is from App uh, Synth. Uh, I wonder when sh when we should start thinking about concurrency usage on our daily basis. Is it something to go for every developer in every project, or rather, there are specific cases when it's actually worth it? So um, if I can kick this off, I think we should use um, concurrency when we are dealing with. Um, with some kind of the performance uh, issues and scale issues. Um, when, for example, our application needs to handle uh, a large amount of um, simultaneous requests or processes extensive data, um, when we would like to par parallelize uh, the, the workloads, um, Yeah, that, that's what comes to my mind right now. I, th I, th I think it, uh, the Elixir ecosystem is very good at providing us tools that take advantage of, of the capabilities of Erlang and Elixir uh, and their concurrency model uh, without us even knowing this. Uh, so, for example, uh, Phoenix uh, opens up a uh, an Erlang process for every request without even asking us to, uh, for that. Uh, whereas in, uh, in, in some, some kind of old, let's say, frameworks like, like Django or Rails or whatever else in, in those older languages, it's not, um, it's not, not, not really easily possible to do that. So this is already a place at which we, we are leveraging the capabilities of OTP 
uh, without even thinking about this for for once. Obviously, we have to uh, be aware of uh, of how it works and how not to um, how not to make some bottlenecks more apparent, just like in the case of those uh, potential uh, database pool issues and so on. But Elixir is pretty much very good at this. Uh, so uh, once you become more and more experienced as a developer, you uh, you get to identify uh, more and more uh, cases in which you you have to think more about what you want to do uh, with the processes uh, because you don't want to uh, interrupt the HTTP request loop. Uh, and since this is still the main protocol uh, the web is using, uh, you always have to think about uh, some more advanced concurrency related issues in cases where you can't afford yourself to uh, to lose any milliseconds of response time uh, doing some things that should not be blocking the browser from seeing the result. So that's probably the first moment in which it appears uh, to be very important for most developers uh, of web applications. Okay, so uh, if there are no more, no more questions right now, then uh, okay, someone's writing, so let's uh, wait for one more second. Uh, all right, uh, it seems that there is uh, there are no more questions. So uh, thank you very much, Mateusz. Uh, and uh, from what I'm seeing, the audience has enjoyed the talk very much. So that's uh, that's a very good thing. Uh, so, uh, well done, Mateusz. Thank you very much for today's presentation.